Good morning, good morning. I am Pastor Tony. Welcome to LifeSpring today. Hey, I want to thank everyone who worked really, really hard on our Christmas Eve service to make it a, a huge success. Thank you. Uh, it was great. We got a lot of new contacts and we're following up on them. And also thank you to everyone who gave uh, in our Christmas offering and toward the end of the year. We really appreciate uh, all of the extra uh, giving that you guys did. I thank you so much for all of that. Hey, we're continuing this morning in our series called Resolving Everyday Conflict. As, um, as Ray Tuttle, one of my elders, and I gathered together to think about, hey, what is the issues, what are the issues that are facing our world today? And we looked back at the last two or three years and we said, boy, conflict's a big one isn't it? I mean, we've gone through a lot of conflict in a lot of different areas of our lives, and a lot of it has come home into families, into neighborhoods, into communities, and so we wanted to start off the year just talking, how do we deal with conflict in a healthy and God-honoring way? And so that's what we're doing. Last week, we dis discussed six ways that we handle, dis we handle conflict in dysfunctional ways. And to, to make it memorable, we talked about some animals that, that handle conflict in dysfunctional ways. And we talked about snakes and wolves and, and weasels and turtles and chameleons. And, and if you miss that lesson, you're going to want to listen to it because uh, there's some good stuff in there about how we process the conflicts in our lives in ways that seem to make sense at the moment but are really uh, really making the conflict worse rather than making it better. And, and we resort to those kinds of dysfunctional ways of dealing with conflict primarily because we don't have healthy boundaries in the first place. If we had healthy boundaries, we wouldn't need to resort to those. So today, we're talking about establishing and enforcing healthy, God-honoring personal boundaries. Now, boundaries became kind of a cultural buzzword back in the mid-80s when authors like John Townsend and Henry Cloud started doing some of these seminars on boundaries. And my wife and I went to one of the first seminars that they did on, on boundaries, and, and it culminated in a book that they published in 1992 called Boundaries. <laughs> okay. Yeah, very creative uh, 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 title for the book, but it was it was right on, right? And since then, the book's been updated several times, and it spawned a whole family of boundary books: boundaries in marriage, boundaries in dating, boundaries at work, boundaries with kids, boundaries with teens, boundaries with teens too, because we need <laughs> we need a couple of those ones, right? I mean, you get the picture. You get the picture. Popularly, the idea of setting boundaries is the practice of openly communicating and asserting our personal values in a way so as to preserve and protect against having those boundaries compromised or violated. That's kind of like the popular idea of boundaries. And that sounds pretty healthy, doesn't it? I mean, you think about that. Sounds pretty healthy. But it's funny how human beings can take something inherently healthy like, oh, I don't know, peanuts, and make a Snickers bar, right? That's what we do. We take something inherently healthy, and, and, you know, I mean, if you go down into Tijuana or into Mexico, you know, they have the greatest candy, right? And what do they do? They take fruit, and they turn it into Candy, that's how I want to eat fruit. That's fruit for me. Fruit by the foot. That's my, that's my daily fruit uh, input, right? But that's what we do, and that's what we do with boundaries. We, years ago, I had a couple in my office, and to, they came in because they needed help in resolving a conflict that they were having. And the husband started, and he began to describe this conflict like this. He wanted to have kids, he wanted to have kids, but his wife was saying they couldn't afford it. And I thought, well, this is a switch. 
<laughs> this is interesting. What's happening here, right? Well, the wife had a really good job, and the husband had lost his job a few months earlier, and he thought, hey, I'm not working right now. We ought to have kids now, because then I could just stay at home, be a stay-at-home dad. I'm at home anyway. And to hear him describe it, it was obvious his wife was being completely unreasonable. But I'm not stupid. And so I turned to the wife and said, well, what do you think about all of this? And she began to explain that, you know, she, her husband had read this article because he's got nothing to do during the day. He'd read this article on the value of breastfeeding. And he felt that that's what they needed to do with their kids. And he thought, here's what his wife could do. His wife could handle the night feedings, you know, because, you know, she's going to be there. And then she could put milk in the fridge and he'd handle all the day feedings, and, 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 and this would just work out perfectly uh, for them. I began to see how some of this conflict was, uh, you know, w- was arising. And, and, and so I, I asked her, well, what do you think you guys ought to do? And she said, well, you know, if, he's, if he really feels like we should be at home with our child, I really agree with that. But why doesn't he get a part-time job? I'll go down to part-time and we'll split the, the, the taking care of the kids and we'll split the working and, and, and we can make it work that way. And, and I turned to the husband, I said, well, what do you think about that? And he replied that losing his job was a very traumatic event for him. It was so traumatic that he realized for his own personal health, he had to set a boundary in his life that he was not going to work. You began to see this conflict in their home, right? And it's like, you know, and it's totally appropriate if as a couple you decide, hey, one of us is going to stay home and take care of the kids in the house and do the domestic stuff, and one of us is going to go to work in the world and do all that stuff and bring home the money. It's perfectly acceptable if as a couple you make that arrangement, right? And, and if it's the guy that stays home or the girl who stays home, it's really irrelevant, right? But as a couple, you make the decision. But as an individual in the couple, you don't get to make that decision, right? That's, that's a partnership decision that you have to make together. And I began to explain that to him, and he was so adamant about his boundary that I felt I had to point out a boundary that God established 2,000 years ago in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. It says, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. How do you feel about that boundary? He didn't like that boundary. You don't like that boundary at all. James says if a man will not provide for his family, he might as well be an unbeliever. And again, it doesn't, it's, it, there's no gender roles specifically in Scripture about this. So if you decide that, that the man stays home and the woman works, it's totally fine. But you decide it together as a couple. And see, this illustrates the the problem with the popular definition of boundaries. We have redefined the word boundary to mean anything I don't want to do, right? My boundary is I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. Well, fortunately for us, God has provided a much clearer and much better definition of boundaries in the scriptures. But before we get there, let's start by affirming what God says about boundaries in general. So open your Bibles or Bible apps to Deuteronomy chapter 19. There's a note-taking outline. If you're here in the service, it's in the back, looks like this, and it's got an action plan for you during the week, and it's got the note-taking outline for right now. You can follow along. If you're at home, both of those are available on the app and on the website. So let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to read together God's Word this morning from Deuteronomy 19.14. We're going to be reading together in the NIV translation, so go ahead and, and read it with me. It says this, do not move your neighbor's boundary stone set up by your predecessors in the inheritance you received in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Now we're going to pray and see what God wants to teach us today. Father, take your word, simple statement from Deuteronomy, and show us how to apply it in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. God affirms that the establishing and enforcing of proper boundaries 
is a God-honoring thing, right? The idea of emotional and relational boundaries, it comes from the, the concept of physical property boundaries. And believe it or not, the American ideal of property ownership comes from the scriptures. It comes right out of the Bible. The original inhabitants of this country did not believe that people could individually, personally own property. They believed that everybody owned the property. And the, the countries that are, are the people came from that settled here in the United States, in those countries, they didn't believe in personal ownership of property. The king owned everything, and the people were his tenants. That was the ideas of property ownership in the world at the time of our founding fathers. That's just the, where they came from. But God established a different ideal. He gave the land to his people to own, to possess, okay? And so who better than God to look to for the rules of personal boundaries? Now, we're all familiar with property boundaries. In my backyard, I have a fence. It tells the world where my property begins and ends, right? There are certain places in our country where violating those kind of boundaries can end up with a backside full of buckshot, right? I mean, you can get, you can, you can find out very quickly uh, that you're not supposed to be somewhere in some parts of our country. Boundaries exist between parents and children, between neighbors and neighbors, between husbands and wives, and between even friends. And these boundaries define um, acceptable and unacceptable behavior. And I'm sure all of you have know people or have been in situations where someone fires off rounds of emotional buckshot because you violated their personal boundary. Crossing a boundary results in consequences. It results in consequences. Respecting a boundary results in rewards. The first question for us to settle is, who gets to set the boundaries? Who gets to set the boundaries? Let's start at the beginning with Adam and Eve. God sets the boundaries for Adam and Eve. He gave them the right to any tree, any tree in the Garden of Eden. But he established a boundary around one particular tree. It says, and the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Consequences for violating a boundary. That boundary was set by God. It was clearly expressed by God. God even defined the consequences of violating that boundary, but they violated it notwithstanding. In verse 6 of chapter 3, it says, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful. Its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. The same thing happens in your everyday conflicts, right? God sets a boundary. He sets a boundary line. And crossing that line comes with a penalty. But life often appears better on the other side of the boundary, doesn't it? Right? Grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, right? Life always appears better on the other side of the boundary. If I could go over there, I know you don't want me to, but if I could go over there, everything would be so much better. And so we push against the boundaries that people set for us. We push against the boundaries that God sets for us. We sometimes even redefine the boundaries in our own minds, at least, uh, thinking that if I redefine it in my mind, God's sure to go along, but it's not true. It's not true. If you violate the boundaries that are set by God, you will always be in conflict with your creator. And not surprisingly, that conflict will involve pain, suffering, you know, uneasiness, discomfort. God is your creator. He knows who you are. He knows how you're designed. 
to function. If you try to operate differently, it's not going to work smoothly. If you violate the boundaries set by your spouse or your boss or your parents or your friends, you will have conflict, and that conflict will inevitably lead to some level of emotional or physical pain. Now, like we discussed last week, some of that conflict will be dysfunctional. It'll be dysfunctional. And I want to address some practical ways to ensure that we don't set boundaries that lead to dysfunctional conflict, like the couple in my opening story. How do we set boundaries that will reduce the conflict that happens in everyday life? Well, when my kids were young, Sylvia and I created some boundaries to ensure that that they would grow up strong bodies, strong minds, strong faith, right? We set boundaries such as don't cross the street without looking both ways. We said, you don't do that. In fact, we, did, we were so effective at our boundaries. When we had, we had established asphalt as the no-fly zone for our kids. And so they would get to the point where we would be at church and the parking lot was asphalt. It wasn't a street, but it was a parking lot. And they'd be running and looking over their shoulders, and they would get to the asphalt, and they would just stop like there was an invisible wall right there, like a force field, just boom. They just, out of the corner of their mind, they saw it, and they knew, no, we don't go there. And, and they learned that boundary. And, you know, they survived to adulthood. So I'm saying we were successful, okay? We were successful, at least in that particular area of our life, Right? Uh, other, other boundaries, not so much. Now, there were consequences if they violated the boundaries that we set for them and rewards if they fulfilled them. And we had boundaries like look both ways when you cross the street. You have to be in church on Sunday. You have to go to school. You have to do your homework. I mean, we had boundaries about things that were important to us. We had set them. In a successful marriage, there are boundaries that have to be respected. Getting home for family dinner was one of ours. Now, you know, I I confess that, you know, there have been times in my work life where there was a term called Tony time. And Tony time meant basically whenever Tony felt like it. (laughs) It's basically what it was. And, And, you know, that's not something that I'm proud of. I'm not proud of that. And at one point, you know, and I knew what time dinner was, but at one point, you know, Sylvia finally said, look, hey, I want to eat at 6.30, but we'll wait for you. To a point. You know, to a point. The kids have homework. The homework has to be done. And so by 7.30, if you're not home, hey, dinner will be in the fridge. You're going to have to warm it up. You eat by yourself. We're going to be working on homework because they have to get it done for school the next day. You know, and so it, it, was a, it was a very, she was very kind about it, but it was a reasonable boundary that needed to be set and needed to be respected. She was protecting a value that God has and that we had set for our families. You establish boundaries not, and this is key for today, okay? You establish boundaries not to assert your personal desires, You establish boundaries not to assert your personal desires. That's just an expression of your inherent self-centeredness, right? That's part of the problem. You establish boundaries for three reasons. We're going to go over each one today. You establish boundaries to assert your identity in Christ. You establish boundaries that say, I will not behave differently than an authentic follower of Christ just to make you happy. I'm not going to do that. You establish boundaries to assert your God-ordained purpose, right? You set a boundary that says, I will not behave differently than my mission allows just to make you happy. And you establish boundaries to assert your destiny as a child of God. You set a boundary that says, I will not behave any differently today than I would expect from the person I'm becoming in the future. These are the areas that you establish boundaries. I did not set a boundary that required my kids to look both ways before crossing the street because I needed to show them who's boss, right? 
I did it because I wanted my kids to survive to adulthood. So let's take a look at the first of those principles about boundaries. Set boundaries to protect your identity in Christ. Who you are. There's a story, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but there's a story about uh, a man who, who uh, was brought before Alexander the Great because he, he fled right before a great battle. And the great ruler asked the man's name, and it turns out the young lad's name was Alexander. And it says that Alexander the Great roared back, son, either change your name or change your behavior, right? That's that's how we should be about God. If you call yourself a Christian, if you name yourself after the name of Christ, you need to live out that identity or change your name, right? 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 Or change your name. Don't call yourself a Christian and act like a Pharisee. You're going to do that, act like a Pharisee, right? Don't call yourself a Christian and act like the world, right? If you're going to do that, call yourself part of the world. This culture is constantly trying to redefine the name Christian to be congruent with its own behaviors, right? They're doing that. They're doing that. That is not who you are. Listen to the Apostle Peter describe uh, your identity in Christ in, in 1 Peter 2.9. He says this, you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests. You are a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Whenever you read that verse, remember, you are not some ordinary Joe in the eyes of God. You have been chosen by the creator of the universe. You have been made a royal priest. You are members of a holy nation. You are subjects of a kingdom of God. You are forgiven. You are redeemed. You are sanctified. You are justified. You are just being transformed. You are one day going to co-reign with Jesus Christ over all the creation. How about that? That's who you are. That's who you are. Don't forget who you are and never, ever, ever compromise who you really, really are for anyone or anything. That's what boundaries are for. Set boundaries to protect who you are as a child of God. Second, protect, set boundaries to protect your purpose for Christ. In ancient Israel, the land was God's to give, and he gave it to Israel as an inheritance. Working the land gave the Israelites their, the Israelites their purpose in life. It was how they provided for their families. It, it, was, it was how they got significance. It was, how they, it was what they did 12 hours a day. You, you think you're tired at the end of an eight-hour day. These guys worked from sun up, sometimes a little bit before, to sun down, right? They, this is where they got their, their personal value and significance. They set boundary stones around their property to clearly identify the extent of their purpose and responsibilities. I am responsible for all of this up to this point. After here, it's you, okay? I, I will take care of all this, but from here on, this is you. You set boundaries to establish your mission, the thing that God has called you to do. You have a purpose in God's kingdom, a field to harvest, a mission to accomplish. You're responsible to establish boundaries in your life to protect that mission. And one of the last things Jesus said to his disciples, we sang about it earlier, says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey the things that I have taught you and be sure of this. I am with you always to the very end of the age. At LifeSpring, what are we about? Making disciples. Let's say it again. What are we about? Making disciples, right? That's what we're here for. Our primary focus for each of us is to be about the process of making disciples, bringing people into the family of God, growing them up 
into the image of Christ. God calls you to tell those you come in contact with that Jesus loves them, to live and love like Jesus in this world, that he has a purpose for their lives, to explain to them that his love compelled him to come to this planet and die on the cross to pay the penalty for their sins. You are to explain that they must personally and individually surrender the leadership of their lives to Jesus Christ as king, and in exchange, Jesus will grant them eternal life. And then to offer them the opportunity to do that through prayer, to actually say, would you pray with me right now? That is your mission, and this world will do everything it can to tell you you can't behave like that. When my kids were in school, the, the school system told us as parents, you cannot talk to the kids about Jesus. But guess what? My wife found ways to talk to the kids about family traditions, like Christmas and Easter, right? To talk to the kids about our, our, our ancestral traditions. I, let's talk about what we did in Mexico growing up and how church was a big part of that, and how Jesus was a big part of that. And, and, and she actually invited a friend of ours to come to school, elementary school, dressed as Santa Claus, and tell the Christian story and give kids an opportunity to receive Jesus in the elementary school, right? Don't let this world tell you what you can and can't do. Let God tell you what you can and can't do right? The, the apostles went before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, and they said, hey, you got to stop talking about Jesus. And they said, hey, you judge for yourself. Do we do what is right before God or do we do what is right before men? I'll give you the answer. We do what is right before, say it with me, God, right? We do what God says. God has given us a mission. This world wants to tell you, you can't do that. Guess what? I'm telling you, you can Okay? Set some boundaries for your life to protect your mission, not to protect your whatever, your, your fame and fortune in the world, not to protect your, your image in the marketplace. Set some boundaries to protect your mission for Christ. Because here's what's going to happen. You will, like many people in this church have realized, you will share your testimony with someone. You'll live in love like Jesus in the marketplace, and you will see someone, the light will come on, and they'll suddenly want to know more about Jesus. They'll suddenly want to hear more about Jesus. They'll listen to you, tell them the story, and if you invite them to pray, they will actually pray and surrender the leadership of their life to, to Jesus Christ, and you will experience the joy that comes with that. And some of you, I know because it happens to me too, is you'll get that calling from God. You'll get that moment of opportunity and you'll think, I need to do this right now. And there will be so many things in this world that will tell you, no, you don't need to do that. Don't do that. Come on, do this, do that. Don't, uh, it'll distract, distract you from the thing that God's calling you to do and you won't take advantage of that opportunity and you will hear about that guy over there that got to lead that person to the Lord. And you'll think, ah, oh, shoot, I missed that. I had that opportunity and I didn't do it. We get to choose. We get to choose what we're going to what's going to define our life. Let it be the mission of God. Don't get distracted by all that's going on around you. Don't get distracted by this world that's trying to draw you away from your identity and from your mission. Only God is permanent. Only his will is going to last for eternity. Set boundaries to protect your identity in Christ. Set boundaries to protect your mission for Christ. Let those be the things that, that cause you to set boundaries. And finally, set boundaries to protect your sustainability in the world. Set boundaries to protect your destiny. You have a responsibility before God to maintain your ministry continuously over the long haul from now until the grave. There is nothing more important for the church of Jesus Christ in this generation than for people to stand strong for the long haul. And to make this personal, what I'm saying is that you are not to behave differently than the person God is calling you to become. You don't do that now. You don't say, ah, I have time to do that. No, you don't. Today is the day. Today is the day. I'm not going to compromise anything 
about my future ministry for anything that's happening in the present. The reality is that I have responsibility to myself, my family, my church, my God, my com- community, to continue to be the person that God has called me to be. I need to set boundaries today to keep spiritual drift in check because this world will draw you away. It'll draw you away. I'm here every, almost every Sunday. I mean, I do take vacation now and then, but, but I mean, I'm here almost every Sunday and not because I'm the senior pastor. I'm here every Sunday. We've been in church every Sunday, practically, since we gave our lives to Jesus Christ. Many of you are the same. Not because I have a job, not because I've got to pass out programs, but because I know that this world will draw me away from Christ. And if I give this world half a chance, it's going to trip me up. I'm here on Sunday because I need to be here on Sunday for me. Now, as long as I'm here, I'll be here for you, right? But, but I need, I'm here because I need to be here for me. And you need to be here for you. You need to be here for you. I'm telling you, you need to be here. This world is going to try and draw you away from Christ. I mentioned the books written by Townsend and Cloud about boundaries and specific relationships. And those books are excellent resources to help you. If you're having trouble setting boundaries in specific areas of your life, get the book. Read it. Start to apply it in your life. Each of those boundaries have an origin in the way God deals with his creation. The boundaries are always consistent and will lead to a life that is abundant when you set them according to God. And too often people set boundaries whose goal it is to make their life more comfortable to make their life easier. You set boundaries and then you fume when somebody steps all over your boundaries. Well, imagine what life would be like if you continue to allow God to set your boundaries. God values who you are today, but he also values very highly the person that you're becoming. Your future self. Value your future self at least as much as you value your present self, right? And God has a lot to say about your future self. Listen to Jesus' challenge here to the church in Philadelphia. This is great. From, from Revelation 3, 11 through 12. He says, I'm coming soon. Amen. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. And they will come down from heaven, from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. I recently read an article where a Christian author was asked, what's going to be the first thing you think about when you are standing before Jesus? And his answer, I thought, was very profound. He said his first thought was going to be... I could have done more. I could have done more. We always think, you know, when I come before Jesus, I got some questions for him. I think more importantly will be the questions we have for ourselves. Why didn't I do that? Why didn't I step up to the plate more often? Well, let me tell you, the chance to do more comes now. Not at the finish line. Set boundaries today that say just to make someone happy, just to please the people in my audience, I will not behave any differently than an authentic follower of Christ. I will not behave any differently than my mission calls me to behave. And I will not behave any differently today than I would expect from the person I hope to become one day, soon. If you're here today, if you're listening today, and Christ is not a part of your life or boundaries or anything like that, you're setting boundaries about your own personal life and and not really about your, your spiritual life, you can change that right now. Jesus created you, and he has been the unseen hand directing you through your entire life to this moment in time. 
and he has brought you here today for a decision. Will he be Lord and King of your life? Will he be the reason, the purpose, the mission, and the identity that you cling to? Will, that, will your future in heaven be the most important thing about your destiny and not your wife or your kids or your job or any of those things? If you have never surrendered the leadership of your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that right now. We're going to close in prayer. And I invite you to make Jesus the king of your life. If you've prayed a prayer like that, and, and you, you've stated that Jesus is to be king of your life, but you realize as we're talking that you need to take it another step further. You need to go a little bit deeper. Jesus needs to be king of some other areas of your life. He's king of your salvation area, but he needs to be king of your relationships, and he needs to be king of your work life and your school life. He needs to be king of your family life. He needs to be king of your business life if if that's true, then you pray with me right now. Let's go, go to prayer. It's time to make Jesus king. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to earth. Thank you for all that you went through that we just celebrate at Christmas. You wrapped yourself in human flesh. You were born in the normal way. The creator of the universe put himself into his creation, wrote himself into the story to become a character in the play. That is so amazing. And it wasn't just a cameo appearance. No, it's the hinge point of history. It's the center point of the human race. You were born in obscurity and, and, and you lived a normal, a normal life as a child, obeying your parents, skinning your knees, getting sick, going to school. And then the time came for you to take on the mantle of leadership and you began to teach and you taught us about God. Oh, it was revolutionary. They called you a revolutionary. It was revolutionary. It was a God who wasn't just a bean counter. It wasn't just ticking all the boxes on, on the, the Ten Commandments. No, you were a God who wanted to be involved. You were Emmanuel. You were God with us and you wanted to be in our very lives in the midst of all that we do and live. Ah, oh, thank you for that, God. And then in the ultimate act of sacrifice and fulfillment, you went to that cross, fulfilling thousands of years of prophecy, and in that act on the cross, you paid the penalty once and for all for the sin of the entire human race. Thank you. Who does that? Jesus does. And Lord Jesus, as we think about your love for us and what you have done for us, and Lord, we think about our failings as we stumble through life, we realize we need you. We need a Savior. And we bow our hearts and we bow our knees and we ask you, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for paying for my sins. And we realize also we need more than a savior. We need a king. We need someone to lead us, to guide us, to walk with us through life. Lord Jesus, please be my Lord and my king. Take control of the throne of my life. Take the driver's seat. And make me the person you created me to be. I ask it for your kingdom's sake. Amen.